Hi, Professor Mays. Hi, Allie. Um, so I decided to do my reflection paper on one of my friends. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, we were actually together. Um, she was my girlfriend for two years when I was 17 to 19. Um, a lot of the time that she was alive, I was not in her life. I was in her life for the two years that we were together, and then she lived with me for a little while as a friend for maybe a month or two, and then um, towards the end of her life, uh, I was, it was with her at the end of her life. So I thought that um, it would be an interesting um, view because I learned so much from being with her, not necessarily about the, the lifestyle or anything like that. What I learned was what it was like to grow up in a very poor neighborhood and the um, access to medicine, to trash pickup, to animal pickup, to dead animal pickup, um, to drugs, to maintenance of the, that part of the city. Um, <clears throat> what I saw, um, was very, um, it opened my eyes to something that I don't think I would have ever experienced had I not been with Danita. Uh, so, I guess what I wanted to start with was I lived with her and her grandmother who was uh, blind in one eye and um, she had a, a she, she could tell you off better than anybody else that I'd ever met and she said many inappropriate things um, but she was uh, funny and uh, she uh, cared for me and she cared for Danita for most of Danita's life. Her mother was into drugs for a lot of her life or with men that were abusive and into drugs. Uh, the neighbor, the house that I lived in with Danita was, um, uh, actually was a judge's house in the, I think, 1920s or something like that. And they still had an outhouse. The house was very small. The kitchen was turned into the bathroom and the kitchen was an add-on. <clears throat> this is still a two-bedroom home. It was very small and filled up with um, all kinds of little critters. Uh, they had a lot of malnourished cats that they would try to feed and um, we were, me and Danita, uh, my background is mixed uh, Hispanic and um, European and you name it, pretty much, it's a part of my background, historical background, my ethnic background. Um, Danita's ethnic background was European, white. Um, but they were um, one of the very few white people that lived in the neighborhood. Um, I know um, in uh, one of our best friends, Donna, who... Uh, who we would go to hang out with and, well, smoke a little weed. But her husband, or boyfriend, I guess boyfriend, they weren't really married at the time, was a crack dealer. And I would see people, very poor people. I would see women come in that had been to the um, hospital because they had had so many miscarriages from smoking crack. Um and they couldn't stop, and there was no help for them. Um, Mama, Danita's grandmother, was got meals on wheels because she, we couldn't afford much um, with us there. I would make her little meals that she liked when I could, you know, every, that when we had money. Um, she would still buy groceries, but she did rely on some of the uh, things that they would offer people, like uh, rides. We would take the taxi. Uh, she would get free rides to the doctor. 
and we would go with her to the doctor. We would go with her to the grocery store or take her. I had got a car from my dad during that time, so then that made us mobile. Other than that, we were riding riding the bus, and Janine and I had both lost our jobs, so um, we were barely making it. But um, my mom pushed through, and um, she she did a lot considering what she had, and all of her kids had drug problems. Um, they had mental problems, mental illness. Uncle Bonnie, which was her um, son, lived there in a very small little cabin-like house. Um, one time he slapped the crap out of my face um, because I said something that made him mad. And um, he slapped Anita. I think, oh, he slapped Anita and I got mad at him and said, don't slap her. And then he slapped me. That was a big ordeal. Um, another time, uh, Danita tried to stab herself in her stomach, and I held my hands in front of the knife to try to keep her from hurting herself. Um, I saw blood everywhere on her stomach, and I thought she had stabbed herself. And I started wiping off the blood, and I realized that she, the knife had cut my hand open down to the nerve and the bone. <laughs> And so, um, and she had been chasing me around with the bat and, uh, broken my windshield and was trying to slam me into the trunk. So we did not have very good relationship. I was very, um, very destructive, violent, uh, emotionally and physically and verbally abusive. Uh, so uh, but I came from a background in my family that was the same. So for me to be a part of her life did not seem abnormal to me. It felt very familiar. I was very familiar with that type of lifestyle. Um, but I wasn't familiar with the poor part of the lifestyle. Even though we weren't rich, we were never, we were middle class. And I had never experienced what it was like to grow up in a neighborhood like that. And to see people selling their food stamps for crack and selling the little bit of food that they had for crack. And I knew they had children at the house. I saw prostitutes. In fact, Donna, one of my friends, the friend that we would go visit all the time, was a prostitute for a while. Um... I don't think people understand how they say sh they should just people that live in very poor places should just get up and you know have a different life because it's not that easy to have a different life when you grow up in that kind of life where your parents are drug addicts and you don't have any support system uh, the schools they don't have as much money the, I worked at a, volunteered at a school once that was a low income school and it was, a, every kid in the classroom needed help to learn how to, to do everything that they were supposed to do and there was one teacher to teach them all. Um, and this was a low income area. So I know about um, low income, the different approaches to try to help people with low income and uh, honestly in Harris County has its own insurance it is uh, what Danita's grandmother used and Danita used uh, Danita ended up having to have a big a surgery she had endometriosis so when it was the size of a football inside of her stomach it took them that long before they were able to take it out because she relied on the Harris County um, hospital district to get her the surgery. It took them approximately a year to get, help her get that surgery. Um, so I will flash forward to 2016, the end of it. Um, I, like I said, I only saw Danita a couple of times after we broke up. Not a couple of times, but we were in and out of each other's life. But uh, one of the relationships I was in, pretty soon afterwards, we um, learned how to, I, um, while Danita knocked out my tooth, 
you can't see it it's replaced uh, that was another thing that she did to me and my um well we ended up getting married uh but the person i was with decided hated danita and so i couldn't have danita in my life anymore although i had forgiven her for the mistakes that she had made um so it kind of just brought up all those feelings i had again that weren't good about her um <clears throat> and even though the person that i was with that didn't want me to be friends with Janita was also emotionally physically and verbally abusive um so there's I wanted to give you a historic context to Danita's life as um a very poor white person in a in a black neighborhood you, know, you go down the street you'd smell crack in the air you wouldn't see police officers one day we woke walked around we would walk from donna's house to our house um it wasn't very far just less than a maybe you know three quarters of a mile uh but one time we did it at two o'clock in the morning and got held up at shotgun point um danita got very scared and ran off after they left because uh they were um uh, about five people that surrounded us, uh, five black males, and one of them had a sawed-off shotgun pointing in my stomach trying to get my purse away, and I kept telling him I had no money, and I really didn't want to give him my purse because I had my inhaler in it, and I know that sounds really silly, but you do some really weird things. You don't know what you're going to do when you're in a moment like that. <clears throat> after they left Anita started running and I was like why are you running and she's like well they're gonna come back and rape us once they realize you have no money I was, didn't even think about that and I still didn't I'm still don't feel very um it doesn't seem to have stressed me out and I don't know why that might be because of my own mental issues um but we did have some resources through the uh, county. Her grandmother and herself. Her grandmother ended up dying probably under Medicare, Medicaid, um, with heart problems. But she lived a long life, a decent life. Um, they gave her a decent life having those um, facilities to depend on. Um, all the different things that we had to help. She even had home health care and I helped. I was her, the person that helped her. For a little while um but i'd like to talk about um kind of when we put this all together and we think about what danita's his history was she was also raped by her brother um the family was very scattered like her, she was more close with her grandmother her grandmother raised her um <clears throat> So, uh, eventually, while we were together, Janita got this really great job um, working in the uh, medical field, sterilizing instruments. And she did this most of her life. She, so, she had good insurance. She had a PPO. She was able, she took care of her mother. Her mother ended up with cancer. And she helped her for a very long time. Um, until she finally died so she was in and out of work doing some traveling and in between being very uh, messed up um, she uh, lived her life as a she was very much an alcoholic and a drug addict um, when we were together we were mainly just smoked weed but um, I know afterwards she started doing a lot of pills and drinking a lot. She did drink a lot when we were together. But <clears throat> one day she called me and she told me that she wanted to, um, she was worried that she was going to die. That her, grandma, her mother had already passed away six months ago or a few months ago um, from cancer. She had been fighting for a good five, six, seven years. Um... And she, uh, Danita was worried because she had a big growth on her neck and she had just woken up uh, a month ago, a month or two ago from, came out of, no, three months ago came out of ICU. She was, um, 
they finally had decided to give her help after she had no insurance. She kept going to emergency rooms and they kept, um, <clears throat> like, telling her, you know, it's no big deal or they couldn't help her. Um, she did this quite a few times and then she got scared quite a few times because she had this big growth growing on her face. Well, finally, she was able to get out on an MRI, and while they were doing the MRI, it burst open, and she started to bleed to death. She went into, they put her in ICU, uh, and she woke up a month later. She told me she didn't really remember anything, what happened, but they had cut the cancer off from her face. It was a sarcoma, which um, it's quite an, a rare cancer, the one that she had, squamous cell, I believe, uh, sarcoma, um, and they cut it off, and it was already starting to grow back again on her neck, and she told me that she was very worried she was going to die soon, and I told her, I don't want you to die alone, I want you to die with people around you that love you. <clears throat> and uh, maybe my sister and I could figure out somehow to help you. So, somehow we got Danita to my sister's house. And somehow my sister got my Danita, took her to MD Anderson to see if they would help her. Well, there was a lot of no's. But some doctor came by and told her, you know, the system... It's not made for people that can't pay. It's it's not. This is a for-profit place. And so very seldom do people like you get the help they need. She said, but I'm going to help you. I'm going to figure out a way to get you in. And so she did. So somehow all... The biopower that had been influencing Danita's family, Danita's life, um, one person changed that for her, um, or tried to change that. Um, the unintended consequence that happened was pretty sad because they did give her chemotherapy, they gave her, um, they did all her labs. She got blood several times because she lost, became extremely anemic and almost died. Originally, her prognosis was about uh, a year. She came to live with us in October and she died on um, Christmas Day in the evening, in the morning around 2 a.m. Uh, so the unintended consequence was although they were trying to help her, the chemo that they used ended up just, um, the cancer actually grew exponentially with the chemo treatment. Um, so Danita, to me, it felt more like she was a test case scenario for them, someone to experiment on. And maybe that seems, um, that seems very much like I'm saying that the cool, the cup is half uh, empty instead of half full, but I, I felt like they didn't treat her fairly because they didn't offer her any type of surgery until it was completely a rat. It was about this big on her neck and face and um, was covering her. And then tangled up with her arter, her carotid, and her juggler, and they just refused to do anything. But they never looked at it when it was a smaller size and tried to get her surgery. Even though they were trying to help her, they were trying to help her by spending as little money as they probably could have. Had she had insurance, I still think that maybe her prognosis and maybe things would have been better. Maybe. But my mother also died of chemotherapy, so I'm not sure if I believe that or not. Um, it wasn't really a public health thing, but it was, um, you know, MD Anderson is for profit medicine. They're supposed to do some nonprofit work, as all hospitals should, but uh, Danita became one of their 
charity cases. Uh, in the end, they sent her home. They, um, you know, didn't offer her much, but, you know, that she would die. die. She was dying. And she uh, talked to me and said, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I'm dying, Mary Jane. I don't feel like I'm dying. Mary Jane is my my um, birth name. I changed my name. Um, I don't. I don't know why they keep saying that because that's not how I feel. And she wouldn't take the medicine that they gave her gave her for her hospice, which was you know morphine and Ativan. And she wouldn't take it. And she was so stressed out. And my sister told her, you know, just just try to take the medicine so you'll feel better. And uh, I went to visit her on Christmas Eve. My sister talked to her. She said she was um, feeling um, at peace. I, um, I'm going to show you a couple of things. Um, this, I'm going to flip the camera. This is Danita's death certificate. These are a few of her things. This is filled up was filled up with pictures and these are all the things that Danita have. Those papers are the her last words. <laughs> the cigarette pack I think is her Aunt Mary's. That's her mom. That's Danita. Uh, I have her and these glasses she used to wear. This was her necklace for the keys. And this was the necklace that she would wear all the time. Uh, she had something about New Orleans. I think it was more of our Anne Rice. She was reading this before she passed away. This is another little thing that belongs to her and her family. Nell was her aunt. Nell was um, mentally challenged. And this is a picture of Danita and Nell. Um, Danita's story isn't the most beautiful perfect story but I know for a fact that she was happy when she passed away and that she was happy for her life so I wrote um, the day that she passed away well later I uh, wrote this for her and I'll read it to you I'm gonna turn around my camera well sweetheart from, well, I guess I'll start with the date, 1923. Uh, I mean, 923 of 1969 through 1226 of 1916. Um, Danita. Well, sweetheart, it's been a few days since I saw you. Remember when I decided to move out and you said, I don't want you to go. It just won't be the same without you here. That's how I feel now. The world just isn't the same without you. You have this special gift. You can find humor in the worst things and the most horrible circumstances. Two days before you passed, I was trying to prepare Ash for your passing. He's my son. He's seven now. He was uh, three then. Two days before you passed, I was trying to prepare Ash for your passing and he just didn't get it. The first thing he said as soon as he saw you was, uh, DJ, you're dying. 30 minutes later, you were in the kitchen laughing because he had said that. And he, anyone else would have been crying. You didn't want us to, to be sad. And believe me, we are trying. We just don't have your gift. By the way, Ash misses you. And I'm so glad you came back into our lives. Even if it was only for a few months. I'm so glad you called me that day. When you were scared, and Benita got you to come here, I think it was the first time in a long time that you were able to be genuine to Danita I fell in love with almost 30 years ago. That, that is the you I remember from the past, and I will carry in my heart now. I forgive, and I forgave you for all the stupid stuff you did. You asked if I could give you a pass because you're young and stupid. I do and I have. But I'm not sure I can give you a pass for breaking my heart twice. 
I love you and I miss you. This is what I wrote to her. I've tried to incorporate a lot of the things I've learned in global medicine and how they connect to everything else and how so little people can make so much change. But the unfortunate thing is that money seems to be still the most important part of that. And one day I hope that it's not. And one day I hope that maybe it's different. Although I am astonished by all the things I've learned in this class. I can't believe the things that uh, people can do when they work together. It's amazing and just unbelievable all of it um thank you and um i hope this i hope that you've learned from this something thank you